Okay, welcome to the third part of our equine pasture management series. This is uh, covering weed management and hay purchasing. Uh, this is two really large topic ac topics actually or kind of clumped into one. So this one may go a little bit longer, but uh, they're, they're three, two pretty important uh, topics to be covering, especially at this time. So as we get going, the first question everybody always asks, and there's always, there's, there's two thoughts and, and some have one preference over another is whether I need to spray or not spray. Um, some people's preference is not, is not to use any type of herbicides or insecticides or anything like that that doesn't come natural to the land and others um, that they, they don't mind it. So we, we try to address from each perspective uh, whatever your preference is. And so if we come out and do a farm visit, that's uh, one of the first questions we'll have is kind of get your thoughts on where you like to go and, and stand with it. But either way, no matter which one you go, the, in the end, you have to have grass competition. If you have a really good stand of grass, that's going to be the key to weed control. Uh, sometimes with herbicides, it might be a little bit easier versus um, without them. But either way, our ultimate goal is to get competition, get the grass really going where it outcompetes the weeds. So if you look on the right hand picture, that stand of grass is going to have lots of weeds in it because it's got a, a, very few uh, grass plants for competition for the weeds. So, the first thing we need to understand is that there are different weeds out there at different times of the year. Just like we have different types of grasses, we have warm and cool season grasses, while we have warm and cool season weeds. And so, I think we get the misconception that if we treat it this time of year, that that's going to that control is going to last the entire year. Um, and, and that's where we can get ourselves in trouble thinking that, um, you know, what we sprayed on there was ineffective and that the, the, the chemical was actually defective, uh, but more, it's more likely just it didn't have the effect on the entire year's worth of weeds. So when we look at the life cycles of our weeds, we look at our cool season weeds, and these are the weeds that are really growing right now. And so this is a little bit of an interactive slide, but for this purpose, we'll just leave it as is. So when these weeds actually begin to grow and start is in late August to, through the fall. And you're not really seeing them, seeing them, but they're starting to grow and pop up. And by early November, we start to see them popping up out of the ground. And at that point, they're growing, but not really very fast, but they are susceptible if we spray them. So that's one of our big uh, missed windows that we get for controlling our cool season weeds is in mid-November through mid-December. And all you need is about three days in a row where the ambient temperature, the daytime temperature gets to 60 degrees. Now, you don't want it to, you know, the day after that 60 degrees drop down to 20 and stay there. But if you can get three days in a row roughly at 60 degrees, um, a lot of our products will work and this would be a great time to really get these cool season weeds. Then, for the most part, most of us come back in here and we start to see them as they come into February, March, they're really starting to pop up and grow. And that's where we start to actually physically see them, uh, maybe standing above the grass. And, you know, we can still get them at this point. So this right now is would be borderline that window um, of whether we can get them or not. And, and I think still safe to say that right now we can still spray those weeds uh, and, and have a pretty good effect. The big problem is when we get to the end of April or the end of March, April, May, and for a lot of us, when we start to notice we have a weed problem is when we have those beautiful yellow flowers out there. And that's when we say, hey, I've got a weed problem. I need to get out there and spray. Well, I can tell you uh, there's two things. One, uh, you are, we can get out there and spray them, um, and we can kill them for the most part. Uh, when the bigger when they are bigger weeds, it becomes more difficult. So some of our chemicals aren't as effective, or we have to use much more of them um, at that time. And number two is even though I could kill that weed, that beautiful buttercup flower, um, it's already produced seed for the next year. So automatically, we're going to go have to go through this whole cycle once again. If we spray them in this section before they hit bloom, we've killed that plant before it goes to seed. So we're one step ahead of of the process. So we need to understand that. We also need to understand from our warm season perspective, much narrower window uh, for them to germinate and a really tiny window for us to really get in there and control those with a herbicide method. So we'll get in here, we'll try to, we see them coming up 
right now towards the end of March, uh, early April, they're growing. We start to really see them pop up when the heat comes on, June, July, and that's our magic window to spray those before they go to bloom, before they produce seed and along the way. One of the big issues we see with warm season weeds is you go ahead and you try to control it early June, you spray, you take care of it, and then a few weeks later you have weeds all over the place again. You think, well, hey, that, that herbicide didn't work or, or something went wrong with what I did. Well, the problem with warm season weeds is they produce so much seed. Um, so there's, not, there's so much seed in the ground from the previous year is that you may have to spray two or three times to get all the different weeds that, that keep popping up. So they, they grow really fast and, and they produce a lot of seed. So, you know, it doesn't mean that you are ineffective in your control method the first time. It just means you have a brand new set of weeds. So, but the thing is, it, over a one or two year period, you can really take control of the weeds if you spray at the right time. So that's where we really try to get our money's worth and the effectiveness is to spray at the right time. So here, here's a really good example of trying to understand weeds. So, uh, you know, if I was just to be driving by the roadside uh, in the spring, in the summer, um, the spring I come out here, I see these be beautiful field of buttercups. And I said, hey, I need to spray and get rid of those. So I go ahead and spray them after they've already bloomed. So they're already going to seed. I spray them. Feels like I, I killed them. And then, you know, Three or four months later, I drive by a field and I see yellow flowers all over it again. And, and so the first thing I go is, well, I thought I sprayed those. I thought I killed them. Um, and that was true that you did kill those weeds that you saw. But, you know, this is where we get into the timing. We have a warm season and a cool season weed. So the buttercup we see during the cool season time and this bitter sneeze weed, another yellow flower we see during the warm season time. So you actually did kill the buttercup. Um, but this is a whole new weed starting to pop up. So knowing and being able to identify the different weeds is important, whether they're warm or cool season, to determine how we're going to control those. Now, the other thing is, is, is weeds that we see at the same time of the year. So these are two different cool season weeds that we see. Um, a lot of us have this in our, everybody has this in our pasture. Uh, this is called buckhorn. And then we get into curly dock. And everybody, it might be in your yard your pasture, everywhere. So two very similar looking plants. If you were just to kind of look out across the, the field, you might see these very similar. So you decide I'm gonna go spray these with something like 2,4-D, which is a generic chemical name. You go out there, you spray it, uh, you can you kill the buckhorn and it doesn't even touch the curly dock. So that's where it gets the importance of actually identifying and knowing which weeds you have, cool season, warm season, and even two cool season weeds is that this may take a different product like Grazon Next or something else to really knock out the curly dock. So you gotta make sure you know what type of weeds you have when you have your, your spraying plan to be the most effective. So we get into a, a few different weeds uh, treatments. Now, these treatments are, you know, there, there's lots of chemicals out there. Some of these are, uh, trade names and some of these are actually the active ingredient. The 2,4-D is an active ingredient that you see in lots of products um, all throughout. You can go to your, your typical box stores uh, about any place and buy a, a treatment that has 2,4-D in it. Um, these other products you have to go to more of a specialty place like uh, co-op or for the for those in Williamson County, Williamson Farmers Co-op, to buy these more specialty um, chemicals. 2,4-D is the cheapest. Um, it will knock out a lot of products. Uh, where we see issues is, is sometimes when the, when the plants get a lot bigger, it takes a higher dose of it or they just don't, they won't knock it out. They, they may shrivel the leaves um, a little bit and then they get a good rain and they're off and going again. So um, it, still is a, it still is a really effective method, but timing is, is key to that and, and knowing what weeds you have to really feel like you get your value for 2,4-D. Uh, Grazon Next is, an, is another one. Um, it, it's, it's more expensive, certainly, than 2,4-D. It's got a broader range of target plants that it will knock out. One of the big things that we like about Grazon Next, and I'll, and I'll get into some other things associated with Grazon Next um, a few slides later, but it's got a residual. 
And so the residual means, you know, for, it's going to control weed or seeds that are in the ground. So not only does it kill the contact plant that it touches, but you're going to have a little bit of residual effect. And, but it's still not one of those where you have a residual effect that I can spray now, control all the weeds that I'm going to see this summer and then later on this fall. So what you're talking about is anywhere from 45 to 60 days of re residual. So I spray now, it's going to get some of the seed that's in the ground right now, um, you know, for 45 to 60 days. So, but there is still, there's not a perfect chemical that you can spray right now that's going to control all the weeds throughout the year. So if you're really wanting to control it, you're going to have to get spray now to knock out some of your cool season weeds and then come back in this summer and try to spray again. Now you start to see that over a couple of years of, of using this year, two years, you'll really start to see a lot of weed control. But once again, we're getting back to making sure that you have uh, a good stand of grass to go along with it. It's a, it's a two-step plan. You can't you can't just spray and, and expect miracles that your grass is just all of a sudden going to pop up and appear and away it goes. So that, that that's, you know, they're, they're a great tool to use in conjunction with other things, but they are something you have to, uh, to use in conjunction with uh, grass. And the final one is pasture guard. It is by far uh, probably the most expensive. Uh, it has got a very broad range uh, of, weeds that it will control uh, but you know the, the the key here is it does not have the residual like the graze on next and in, in the next slide or two you're going to see um, where the advantage will come to to this um, depending on your situation but it, it it's expensive but it will control the weeds that it hits it's also a contact one so but it's uh it's, it's, it's very good it's pop popular in a lot of uh, equine pastures so, and one thing I want to mention here is a lot of people have questions. If you'll look at the label of a lot of your weeds, you'll start to see that they have withdrawal times, that animals cannot be on this, this um, pasture or so, you know, X amount of days, some of them are 30 days after you apply it. Well, typically, I won't say typically, those, those withdrawal times are specific to animals that are entering our food chain. It does not have anything to do with animals that are just grazing it. Um, you know, that's really more for how you feel as far as how long you want to pull them off of it. But those withdrawal times don't have anything to do with the safety of the animal being back on there. They're specifically for animals that are in the food chain. So, you know, you don't have to necessarily abide by those, those exact times when you're talking about your horse. That's more of kind of whatever you decide for yourself. Uh, but I just want to make sure everybody's aware that's kind of a misnomer that we hear quite a bit. So here's the method when we get into if you decide that you know the herbicides aren't um, something that are really up my alley what I want to do and so the key for the success of your pastures really comes into competition, competition, competition. If you have enough things out there enough grass, enough clover out there to outcompete the weeds, to suffocate out the weeds, to suffocate out the sage grass that we're, we're seeing a lot out there, um, your grass will win. Uh, but over time, as we have, you know, if we get a hot, dry summer, some of that grass just dies out over time. Uh, anytime you have those gaps, that's where weeds are going to fill in. So you have to continually be adding um, and reseeding, filling in those gaps where weeds are going to try to grow. Because your, your grass is naturally, over time, some of it's going to start to die off, and you have to be there to reseed it. Um, overgrazing, this is one of the biggest issues that we get where we start to have gaps, is if you overgraze it. Um, and horses are, are notorious for, for overgrazing in certain areas of our pastures because of uh, the way they, they drop their fecal material. So you got to really maintain, that's where we get back to that three to eight inches. Um, method that we talk about. If, they get, if it gets down to three inches, get them off there. Allow that grass to recover so it maintains the thickness of its stand. Uh, soil test regularly. And, and, and the reason why we do that is to maintain the thickness um, by the grass being able to thrive with all the required nutrients it has. It's, if it's got a pH that's too low, that grass is not going to be able to pull the nutrients out of the soil that it needs to survive. So it doesn't matter if we pull, if we put all the nutrients it needs based on our soil test, if we don't have the right pH, it's not gonna be able to use them and it, the environment's gonna be more favorable to weeds surviving than it is the grass. So 
get that soil test done and get, um, get those required nutrients in the ground, get that pH above six, six to six and a half is, is where we really like to be. Get it there and your grass will be in that optimum environment to really survive. And, and then clovers to the rescue. And the reason why I put that, they're kind of a magic uh, bullet that we have um, and they're, they're free dollars. Um, for one, they fill in the gaps where the grass is maybe thinned out some. Um, they'll, they'll fill in that gap. They'll be able to outcompete weeds. Uh, number two, they provide a great source of protein to our horses, uh, especially if we're doing haze, but a great source of protein. And, and three, uh, they're a free nitrogen source. If we talk about having a pretty good stand of clovers in the spring, you're talking about 30 pounds of free nitrogen um, that you wouldn't otherwise have. If you just had a stand of pure grass, you might have to put 30 pounds of nitrogen on your grass um, to get a, that really good boost. If you've got clovers in your stand, you can get up to 30 pounds of nitrogen added to your stand and really get your grass up and going. So, you know, th those, are, those are all ways that you can try to increase the thickness of your stand so that you have a higher quality stand for those not wanting to treat with herbicide. The advantage of the herbicides is you get to the end result quicker. You eliminate the weeds um, faster because you're eliminating some of those cycles. Um, with the, without using herbicides, you just have to kind of do it slowly over time. You mow the weeds down before they get the opportunity to go to seed. So you've got a lot more frequent mowing and you try to do all that you can to make sure your grass has got the environment it can to have the, the maximum capacity for it. So I referenced this a little bit earlier when I talked about um, some of the different spray options. And this is true, good sprayers do make good neighbors um, because you have to be very careful when you go to spray uh, of drift. You know, if you've got, if your neighbor is downwind of you and you're spraying out there today, you know, those, those chemicals can drift on a, on a, especially a spring day. That's why we, you know, we see spraying in the spring a lot more difficult than spraying in the fall. Typically our fall days when they're nice, you don't have quite the wind. The spring, we have a lot more wind during those nice days and we get a drift and you know that comes on down to somebody's tomatoes and they're they're pretty upset and so the same thing goes with runoff now most of our chemicals you can spray them and they will get into the plant system pretty quickly they will stick and we have some different products that we add called surfactants that allow them to almost or like stickiness they hit the plant they stick there um, but you do have this small window for a lot of them where you know they are susceptible to rain so if you you spray them on there and then 10 minutes later you get a big rain, you're gonna see a lot of those maybe wash down if, you, if you've got an area, they may wash to an area that you're not wanting them to. Uh, herbicide persistence. And this is where I get into Grazon Next. So Grazon Next is um, one of those that we, we said had a residual, which is good if you know what you're planning on doing with your pasture. If you say that I, on my pasture, I'm always going to feed hay to my horses and I'm not doing anything with the manure and I'm, I'm always going to use this as a, a pasture and I'm not doing, uh, I'm not selling hay or doing anything like that. That's fine. But graze on next, like I said, has a persistence. So if I was to take um, that hay and sell it to somebody and their horses ate, ate it, and this is kind of where we get into manure and hay movement, ate that hay and then dropped, it, dropped the manure. And if they took that manure and put that on their garden, it would kill all their tomatoes. Uh, so it is legume or legumes like soybeans, tomatoes, um, clovers, anything like that. It will persist up to, they, they typically say beginning at two years, but we've seen it up to four years that it will persist. So if you're looking to sell your horse or put your horse manure on your garden, um, and you've sprayed your pastures with Grazon Next, you're not going to have a garden there for three or four years, more than likely. Um, and you're not going to be able to plant clovers in that field either for two or three years. So if all you're planning on doing is, you know, raising your own hay or you're just got a grass pasture and you don't really want to put clovers in there, then Grazon Next is a great, a great product. Because like I said, you've got a little bit of that persistence left in it. Um, residual that's going to take care of weeds on down the line. But you've got to know your situation because if a horse eats it and uh, then has to urinate, 
he's patched hay off that or grass off that and has to urinate, goes somewhere else and urinates and you, you've got clover there or you've got tomatoes there, it's going to kill those, those um, tomatoes or that clover. So it will travel and there's no time period as far as getting rid of it. You can't compost the manure for a year and then spread it. It's still in there. So there, there's nothing wrong with the product. We just want to make sure everybody knows is that you need to know what you're doing. So you need to know if, some, if you're buying hay from somebody that uses graze on next, that just don't plan on um, putting that manure onto your garden. Okay, so it's important to know when you're buying hay if it was produced, if it had graze on next sprayed on it, or it's important to know that you tell somebody if you're selling horse manure or you're selling hay off your property, make sure you let them know that you sprayed graze on next because that will have a big bearing on what they do. So uh, I know that there's probably some questions about that. We can address them now or we can address them later, but um, that's just something to be aware of. So now we're gonna transition um, into purchasing hay. And these are just things, and it, this is not going to go all the way in depth into the nutritional part of it. Um, it's things kind of from the pasture perspective that you might need to know as you go about purchasing hay. We're getting into the season where that, that first cutting is starting to be produced and you may typically like to buy that first cutting, um, whether it's here or someplace in the uh, Midwest or out West. So this is a good opportunity to, to check this out. So we'll kind of go through the three or four of these things as we go. So we have, I've listed uh, about six different species. There's certainly other species of, of hay out there, but one of them is, is tall fescue. And tall fescue can sometimes get a, get a bad name for what it is. Um, but out of all these right here, um, cool season wise, it's the only one that's gonna last in Tennessee. It's got great staying power if we, if we maintain it right. The bad part is if you've got brood mares, that's where the issue comes with the end of fight. So if you've got brood mares, that's where you're gonna to have to pay attention and make sure you remove them uh, three months before their uh, last gestation period. So, but orchard grass, orchard grass is another popular hay here. Um, as a pasture, it does not work at all. It will not stand up to grazing pressure at all. And it's got a much shorter life period than fescue, uh, just because it's not designed to stand up to the heat and humidity that we have here. Uh, and, and tall fescue and orchard grass are probably are gonna have more sugar, a high, higher sugar content during that first, especially that first cutting as we get into later in the year, it's gonna get a little bit lower, but the first cutting is gonna have a pretty high sugar content. We get into Bermuda and Teff. These are some of our summer forages. These are typically gonna have um, lower sugar content. That's why a lot of um, horse owners, especially with some um, horses that have weight issues, they like to feed Bermuda uh, because it's got a lower sugar content. Um, and a lot of that comes from the leaf spacing uh, and the amount of sunlight. So Teff, Teff is kind of one of these that's new, newly hit the scene in this area. It's got a really high protein content. Um, one of the struggles with that is it, it has a really thin stem and so it falls over on itself and kills itself. So it's really hard to maintain that one. Uh, you guys are a lot of familiar with alfalfa. That's a legume. That's not meant for grazing period at all, um, but it's a good supplement for, for protein sources. And a lot, of, a lot of these things like tall fescue we see mixed with clover. That's how you boost the clover. And so the alfalfa may be mixed with orchard grass or something like that. Um, Timothy. Timothy is typically what you would call the, the horse hay. Um, we just can't produce it here. It just does not have the ability to be produced here. Um, but it, you know, depending on it, where you're shipping it out from, you know, there's, these are all good ones. You know, certainly for Timothy, you're gonna have to have that shipped in. So form, we get into form a lot and, and there's a lot of misconceptions um, about you know, which, which one is better. And it all comes down to your situation. Uh, so I'll kind of give you a, 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 my thoughts and feelings about the, each one of them and then something you need to be aware of when you're purchasing it. So a lot of times, you know, we seem to think that the, the square bale is superior to the round bale. And, you know, I could produce both of these um, hay products and forms on the same field on the same day at the same time. And, you know, 
in the end, I've got the same product. Now, how we store that, how we take care of that is, is the key and where the misnomer comes in. So as long as we take both of these forms and keep them in a dry barn, you know, you have the same product. You have much, a much larger amount of the round bale, but the square bale is the same product. Um, the biggest issue that we had a long time ago was that the round bale was always kept outside. Most people didn't have that. Well, we've over the last 15 years, there's a program called Tennessee Ag Enhancement that has allowed um, a lot of farmers and hay producers to be able to build barns specifically for hay. So a lot of majority of our round bales are now kept inside during that entire time. So they're just as good when they come out as when they went in. So, but where we need to find out is figure out what is our situation call for. Um, if you are feeding, you know, horses by hand every day, of course, you're going to try to probably feed these square bales. If you have, you know, five or six horses out there um, and, and you put a round bale out there and, it, it, you know, it's middle of fall, middle of summer um, or winter and, it, and we don't have any rain being forecast, this, ra this round bale is perfectly fine. They're going to be able to eat it fast enough that they get to use it. You know, we don't have any weather coming on it they can eat it and utilize it. If I put this round bale out here for two horses, it's gonna take them much longer to eat. They're gonna probably play around in it. They're going to have a chance for a greater chance for weather to be coming because it might take them weeks to eat down on this bale, depending on the, how cold it is. So, you know, this bale could work perfectly fine if we have a bunch of horses and they're gonna, if they eat round bales really quickly, um, if you've just got two, that may not be the scenario. Another thing is if you have one of those hay saver huts that you can keep this bale protected, that's going to allow you to extend that bale. So maybe, you know, if you've got three horses, maybe that you can extend the life of it without them getting it into as far as weather. So e either one works. It just depends on your situation on whether the round bale or the square bale fits and, and the number of horses you have and how fast they're eating it will determine that as well as the weather. Uh, the, the second part, and this goes for each bale, is be aware of the product you're buying. Uh, when it comes to the square bales, you know, if you say I'm buying, I'm going to buy a bale at $6 a bale, and you have two people offering you a $6 bale, or you have one person offering you a $5 bale, one offering you a $6 bale, if you take the quality out, you could have as much as a 30 to 40 pound difference between what somebody calls their six pound or their six dollar bale and what this other person calls their five dollar bale if their five dollar bale weighs 30 pounds more than this six dollar bale uh, it didn't or, or or opposite it you know it doesn't pay necessarily to buy the cheaper hay if it's not going to have near as much um, poundage and, and the same thing goes for here um, you know we, we can sell two bales that are forty dollars a piece and there might be 200 pounds difference between each bale. So know what type of bale you're buying because it's not always, uh, what we really like to go is pay by the ton or pay by the pound, more likely by the ton. That way it doesn't matter, you know, the size of the bale, you're paying by the, the tonnage. And so, but most time, most people don't do that. So know what type of bale, know your baler, know what kind of bale he's producing. Make sure you're getting your money's worth just purely from a poundage. Uh, perspective. Uh, timing, we get into timing. This is a huge, this is one of the biggest factors you can have as far as when you purchase your hay is the stage of maturity. Did they get out there and did they get that hay produced when it was still in the leafy vegetative stage, this phase two? Or did they come out here and bale it after it already gone to seed? And so at that point, it's no longer in vegetative stage, it's more in growth, it's got more cell walls. And so it becomes a lower quality hay if you're buying something that's already gone to seed. And so that can make a big difference, making sure they got the correct stage of maturity before they bailed it. And you know, a lot of guys out there, um, or people out there, don't get it bailed at the right time. And that kind of leads into our, our next one. But you, if you get it right there, right before it goes to seed, and you start to see seed heads in that pasture, then you're getting it at the right time. It's going to have higher protein content. It's going to have a higher water content. It, it's going to be a higher quality hay. Um, the next one becomes the window of bailing. 
And this is where the misnomer with tall fescue comes in. And it's oftentimes because tall fescue is often uh, bailed at the wrong time. So it's bailed too late in the year or too late in the season. So it's gone from this vegetative stage to more likely to this um, reproductive stage. So the quality of it has gone down. And so what we look at, what we look at here is getting it done in the right time. So when we talk about tall fescue, orchard grass, and timothy, why do we call, why is timothy the best um, hay often? That's because it's the window. So tall fescue, between the time when it's at its peak nutritional value and it hits reproductive stage, is only about two weeks. So if you've got a guy that he's bailing, you know, six or seven, ten places, and you know it's raining during this time, he's going to bail a lot of those farms when that hay is out of its peak stage. So we're bailing hay that is out of its peak stage, so it's not near worth as much as some of these others. So you know, automatically we, we've we've lowered the, reduced the quality of the tall fescue hay. The next window, largest window, is orchard grass. It's got more in that four-week stage, uh, three to four-week stage. So we've got a little bit more options, and if we have bad weather, we can still get in there and get that orchard grass cut at the right time, and so it's still like, got that good nutritional value. The largest window, of course, as you can probably see as we're going through here, is Timothy. And so Timothy has a window, you get into that five, six week range where it can still be of a high quality hay. So, you know, it all depends on when we get out there and got it bailed correctly. So that, that can be a, a really big point is knowing when your baler, if he's bailing it for you or if you're he's bailing it for somebody else and you're buying it, is getting out there and getting it done at the correct time. So fescue can is an outstanding source of hay. Uh, but oftentimes we just get get it bailed at the wrong time, so then it becomes it reduces the nutritional content. But um, as far as nutritional content, it, it, it's right up there with orchard grass and, and, and timothy when you bail them at the correct times. And and finally, we get into the number of cuttings, and the number of cuttings has to do with you got your first cuttings, you know, the cuttings that are usually done in late April, early May. We start to get into those. Those are oftentimes our best cutting of hay. They've got the highest nutritional content that we're gonna see from that plant for the entire year. That next, the next cutting, and this is all perspective with cool season forages, that next cutting is gonna be encroaching depending on how early they got into the April time or the, the June time. And we may or may not start to see a lot of heat. You know, the, the rain may shut off, and so we're going to see a less vegetative. That plant's starting to shut down. It's starting to suffer from heat. Um, so it's starting to shut down. It's not growing near as fast. And so our nutritional contents might be, might be a little bit lower for that one. It's all dependent on, on the weather. If we get a good amount of weather, if they put some nitrogen on after that first cutting, you know, you can still get a pretty good cutting of hay if everything cooperates. Uh, but then some of us were fortunate enough to get three cuttings. If, hey, if we get enough rain all summer long, like last year, uh, we had enough rain all year long, is that it provided enough uh, water to get a third cutting. It's by far going to be the smallest cutting. We're going to have um, the least amount of tonnage coming out of that, um, but you're going to have your most likely your lowest quality as far as nutritional value coming from that third cutting. So it's important to know. I, I always like to ask is, uh, what cutting this is coming from. Um, first and second, you know, depending on the year, there may not be much difference. Um, but definitely we get in that third, uh, there is a big difference. But if we get a really hot, dry, late spring, uh, early summer, then there may be a big difference between that first and second cutting. Uh, and finally, we get into just knowing the quality. And so this is something where we can really have an impact right in here. So three things that you really need to do when you start looking at your hay. And, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes unless you've got somebody you really trust and you've been buying for year after year. Um, but if you're going to be talking about buying a lot of hay all at one time, whether it's you're going to buy a seasons at a time or you're going to buy your whole year's worth at a time, 
before you make that large investment, you know, see what you're looking at, smell what you're looking at, um, and, and finally we did the analysis. But get a visual appraisal. I, I can bail a green bale, um, and, and if you just look at it, it'll look, it'll look awfully pretty. But if I just bailed it and that entire field was weeds, um, it looks green, but it's the, the quality is, is zero. So get in there, get a visual appraisal, see what's going on. Uh, at the very bottom down here, I have a picture of a foxtail. This is a huge problem this year uh, with the drought. These went crazy. People are still trying to bale hay. And so if you've ever had a, a horse eating foxtail, um, if you look at their gums, um, it looks like they've just been stuck with a you know, thousand needles just right in their mouth. That's what it feels like when they eat this foxtail. And so you'll start to see that in some of those late summer cuttings of hay that we get is you'll start to see if they got it bailed really late, foxtail had already gone to seed and it started to reproduce. And so you'll see these seed heads in there. You're not going to see them during the early spring. You're going to see them during the late, uh, late summer, early fall production if you do see them. Um, but that's important for visual appraisal. If you buy a load of this, you might as well just go ahead and throw it away um, because your horse will be miserable eating these. Uh, the next part comes in is into smell. It should have a really good smell to it. Uh, once again, if you buy a, a green bale, it looks real pretty on the outside. Uh, if it, when you open it up, if, it, if there's a bunch of weeds in it, it will smell like a bunch of weeds in there. Um, you also don't want a really uh, moisture um, kind of a smell to it. It smells kind of wet. Um, but in the, it should have a nice uh, smell to it. So make sure you get a smell. And finally, this is the, the most underutilized thing that we can have right here because I can bale a lot of really nice bales and they just don't have the quality. They look pretty, they smell pretty, and they don't have the quality. And so what we can do is a forage analysis. And there's two, there's two types of ones. Um, one of them is kind of what we call the basic. And that's going to give you everything down to water-soluble carbohydrates um, right here, right above lignin. And so for the most part, that's all the information most of us really need. Um, you can do the, the basic or the horse pro, and that's going to break down into sugar content. So if you're really worried about um, the sugar contents of your hay, if you've got a horse that's, um, that struggles with weight, you know, you might want to know the sugar contents, and that's where we start to get down into the sugar contents down here. Um, but you, you, it, it comes down, it gives you dry matter moisture. So for like this one, this July 16th, what I'm looking at right here, 30% moisture. That's, that is extremely high. I'd be really worried about that hay molding once I get it in the barn. Um, that's almost haylage. That's what we use for cattle almost. Um, and so 10% is where we're looking at, somewhere in that 8 to 10% as we go down here. Um, you know, that, that this 24.61, it means there's more likely some alfalfa going on in there, some clover, something is going on there, the adding the extra uh, protein in here. The 9.62 is probably where we would see a lot of our grass haze falling in. So um, we can, if you ever want to do this, we can help you go through that and understand what each one of these actually means and what it means to the quality of your hay. But I, I recommend this anytime you're buying any amount of hay, uh, especially if you're buying a large amount. This is something really simple and really cheap. It, it's going to cost you the, the cost of, you know, two or three bales, depending on which one you get. And if you're buying th a thousand bales or hundreds of bales, you know, this can, make, this can tell you the difference between whether you have a really good hay or not. If you get a really good hay, oftentimes you don't have to supplement very much. If you've just got a horse on pasture, uh, that good quality hay can cover everything that that horse may need. If you've got a poor quality hay, that might indicate you're going to have to supplement something else along the way. But you'll never know that just by looking at your hay. You have to get in there and, and actually understand it and know it. So if you ever have any interest in it, you can contact our office, and we have the tools that, that can help you take that sample and then help it get it analyzed. At, um, uh, any time. There's a couple of different services that do that. But this is the most underutilized thing that we can do is get a forage analysis. That can tell us lots of things and save us lots of money down the road. So th that's the end of that. Um, does anybody, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to, to address that. Um, but if not, we, um, our next section will be on summer survival. So trying to, um, some techniques that we can use to maximize our fescue forages. Um, and I may have a few webinars in between here and there that will deal with 
few other topics besides the pasture. So um, be on the lookout for a few of those that might be on down the line. Um, and if there's no questions, then I will see everybody at the next session. And this will be once again posted to YouTube. And if you have any questions whatsoever, contact me. We can talk, we can do kind of some pasture visits or we can talk about some of the tools and how you can utilize them. Okay, let me. Okay, go ahead, go ahead and ask. Is that me? Yes. Can you, can you hear me?